In this podcast, we strive to understand more about the specialty chemicals business in general and Anupam Rasayana, a leading publicly listed specialty chemicals company in particular. We speak with Gopal Agarwal, who is the CEO of Anupam Rasayana, to understand more about the company's journey, product evolution, the expansion plans, and more importantly, what does it take to start such a company in 2024? Tune in. My first question to you that this entire change of careers from a deal maker to the CEO, how has that change really been? Oh, Shuja, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, I guess a good question. Uh, I mean, definitely something which, uh, you know, I kind of thought over, I would say, uh, pretty uh, for a long period of time. Uh, as you rightly said, I've been a banker, you know, across my career for almost 25 years. Uh, but just to give you a bit of a, a background, you know, initial seven, eight years have been in consulting, you know, where I have held a lot of large corporates, you know, like the Hindustan Lever, the BSF, the Pfizer's of the world, uh, also doing consulting, which was, you know, with some of my, you know, technical, let's say, kind of colleagues around, where I have, you know, kind of a, a, what you call, you know, gone to the plants, you know, done uh, X amount of uh, supply chain studies, consulting. So, I, uh, you know, definitely initially those days where <laughs> I did, you know, kind of a, uh, take my hands, you know, on some of those part of it. And then somewhere, you know, I guess destiny took me uh, more towards the uh, the innovation banking career. And, uh, you know, the last uh, string was, uh, you know, as a head of uh, uh, Edelweiss uh, or Noama now, uh, you know, of their innovation banking division. Uh, so you're right, you know, I, I guess, uh, honestly, I had a pretty uh, fulfilling career, uh, you know, uh, God was kind, uh, things were going pretty well. Uh, it's just that, you know, somewhere, you know, uh, comes a point in your life where you start thinking uh, uh, while, you know, the deal uh, maker, you are constantly, you know, one of those guys who's on the, uh, you know, uh, run, uh, I would say, uh, on the treadmill, you know, from one deal to another one, you know, and it, it's definitely something which I always liked, uh, you know, meeting who's and who's of the world, you know, being in the thin and thick of the things and that whole excitement of, you know, kind of a, let's say, working uh, with who's and who's of the world uh, and, uh, you know, in, in, in that action. Uh, and I'm obviously a guy who likes meeting people, who likes, you know, kind of a trying to get a better sense of industry, how things are working and all of that. So yeah, uh, uh, it was pretty good. Uh, uh, it's just that I guess uh, at some point of time, I started thinking while I'm doing enough and more for, let's say, X set of corporates, you know, in terms of probably helping them raise money, helping them with their MNE strategy uh, uh, or whatever the plans they have. But somewhere that sense of belonging uh, to say that, okay, this is something which belongs to me. Uh, this is something which, you know, mm. uh, I'm going to be working and, you know, this is something which is going to, hopefully last longer with me uh, was a thought which was always kind of uh, coming to my mind and which is where you know uh, after giving a x amount of consultation i thought maybe uh, one of the way to achieve that could be is to go back to a corporate uh, where uh, there is a you know there's something which you're going to do for a long term uh, you know while of course when you work in mm -hmm. you do work for your client but that's transaction based uh, you know there will be one transaction and of course if you've done a good job you will be with him you know for another transition but still it's transition based so cutting the long story short i do yeah. was to you know have that sense of belonging uh, and which is where i kind of uh, said let me uh, take a bit of a leap of faith uh, and also somewhere i i would just say that uh, i was in a bit of a comfort zone uh, you know things were touched going well uh, <laughs> i felt if i need to do something maybe today is the time uh, maybe after a point of time i may not be relevant and hence uh, uh, the reason. How people sort of uh, reinvent themselves and taking sort of really these positions of getting out of your comfort zone. Talking about the organization, Anupam Rasaya now. Uh, Gopal, tell us a little about this in terms of the specialty chemicals industry, right? Not much is really known because every day people talk about a new AI coming in, a new technology solution coming in. But this is the hardcore where industries are sort of really being set up, manufacturing space. India has the vision to become a five trillion economy. Some experts extrapolate this could be achieved by 2028, some give a 2030 number. What do you think organizations like Anupam Rasayan have a role to play in this critical number? So let me kind of put this into two aspects. One is the industry uh, as a whole, and then I'll talk about uh, Anupam, uh, you know, let's say more in specific. So, Shriya, I do believe, uh, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, quite a few other sectors, you know, specialty chemical is something where you would see huge amount of growth. And there are multiple levers which are driving this growth. Uh, you know, one, uh, the industry per se is growing a lot. Two, there are a lot of, I would say, factors, you know, which now are playing in uh, favor of India, uh, you know, 
there are you know certain geographies where you know people are wanting to kind of uh, let's say diversify there are certain geographies which are becoming i would say a uh, lot more expensive uh, you know to produce and hence you know india has an advantage of course uh, i would say even in terms of overall technology uh, and you know bit of that long term vision of promoter is something which i'm sure you also have seen uh, you know in last i would say 10 12 years very you know promoters have now started thinking of what is you know you know helping kind of survive in the long term then sure. trying to be uh, you know someone who is basically more looking at short term so you have had a era where you know typically uh, most of the uh, let's say uh, chemical guys uh, you know would import let's say in our parlance what we call as n being the final product so you know you would import maybe a n minus 4 or 5 you know probably do a couple of steps and then export it back uh, that was an era and of course uh, nothing wrong with that uh, but people did realize that uh, you know that's not something which is going to really take you along uh, and which is where people started the journey of i would say mm -hmm. amount of technology innovation going and doing backward integration and that's something which i would say you know to sum it up is uh, really you know giving x amount of comfort to a lot of these mm -hmm. multinationals let's say outside of india to say you know can we now really look at india who basically has enough and more r d focus who has a decent amount of backward integration and hence i can really have someone a little more reliable let's say in india sitting out and you know he is the someone who's going to help me sort my whole supply chain. I don't need to necessarily worry about uh, what it is. And you know the focus then for him would largely be only on the final product. So that's a, I would say a bit of a journey which you know uh, the whole specialty chemical uh, industry I would say in India has kind of gone through. And uh, which is why I do believe uh, there is a lot more you know in terms of future growth and otherwise which is holding uh, as far as the industry is concerned. So that's more on the industry side of it. Uh, coming to Anupam, uh, I would just say uh, definitely, you know, among one of those fewer companies who has been focusing, uh, you know, to build a long term, I would say, kind of a partnership with our customer. And the reason why I use partnership is that we are largely a B2B uh, custom manufacturer. Uh, and what I, yes. what I mean by that is that we are basically manufacturing something not to sell, you know, in the market, but we are manufacturing something very specifically from a customer, a customer, our identified customer well in advance. Uh, where you know we have spent let's say a journey of anywhere between maybe two to five years to basically develop that molecule or that you know chemical uh, and it has gone through it x amount of i would say you know what you call uh, the checks and balances before customer is kind of approving me that's number one and two you know why is he approving it's not just because you know he's looking for an alternate supplier not just because he's someone who's looking for a supplier who can supply him at a lower cost he is coming to me, I would say, for multiple reasons. One, as I said, a supplier who, I would say, for most of our product, we are decently backward integrated, which would mean that, you know, what we buy is a commodity and then what we end up supplying to a guy is a very niche. Maybe, let's say, one of those products which nobody else largely, I would say, you know, in the Maldives manufacturing, or maybe there are two or three guys at Max who would be doing that. So to that extent, this is something which is very specific and I said custom-made for my customer. Two, the biggest, I would say, the backbone of the company is the technology. Uh, you know, what we are able to do, uh, you know, on the similar product. And a lot of the product, basically, which we manufacture are the product which were manufactured by our customers, let's say, in their own geographies, be it Judo, be it Japan, be it, uh, let's say, you know, US. And what we have been able to do, you know, uh, because of our technology and R&D focus is produce the same, uh, let's say, material at a much better quality, at a much better efficiency, and of course, you know, with a fully backward integrated supply chain, and least is the cost part of it, because if you're doing all of that, of course, you're going to be one of the guy who's going to be most efficient uh, on that. Uh, but the, the fact that I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that the customer is not coming to me just because of cost. Uh, that's not the only hook I have. Uh, there are multiple hooks which I have, uh, which is uh, the reason why, you know, the customer is choosing me. So, so that's, I would say, you know, has been clearly, I would say, you know, uh, three or four strengths of Anubha, which is the technology and R&D uh, backbone uh, to a large extent, you know, backward integrated. And last but not the least, X amount of heavy investment, you know, in CapEx. Uh, see, because after going through that drill of two to five years, the customer would want you to start supplying. Now, mm. at that point of time, I can't go and build a, a plant because sure. the building of a plant at least will take anywhere between 15, 20 months, sometimes 24 months. You got to, you know, uh, invest ahead of time. And that is something, again, I would say has been one of those uh, vision of our promoter, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Anand Desai, that he kind of saw that and he's done uh, X amount of, I would say, hard work 
So on a lighter note for me, I've been, you know, the decent amount of hard work has already been done. Uh, <laughs> and I got to just ensure that, uh, you know, I, I don't do anything wrong and, you know, kind of take the legacy forward. Thanks for that. And you have just answered this in your own way, in the humorous way, adding a dash of humor. So Gopal, I understand from you that there has been transformation from an India perspective, from an industry perspective. But if you were to tell me transformational, like what has dramatically changed from India? It is certainly on a global map now. If you look at the amount of investments coming, or if you look at the appreciation of the West towards India, what really has dramatically changed? One from an India perspective, and second, definitely the specialty chemicals industry. Again, I would say you know uh, there are uh, you know uh, two ways to look at it. So one are basically some of the uh, tailwinds uh, you know uh, uh, globally, which are helping uh, let's say the India pass, uh, and some of it I kind of add there too is that you know a share diversification. Uh, you want to do a diversification, uh, but do you really have someone capable enough to do it in India? And mm -hmm. I will cover that part you know, a little, uh, little later. I mean, you have had, as I said, uh, you know, X amount of promoters in India who have over a bit of time, you know, invested in, you know, let's say technology, R&D, capacity building, which basically, you know, has made them ready that if someone is looking for diversification, do you have someone in India who's going to do it? So that's uh, number one. Uh, number two, as I said, Definitely, you know, India has an advantage of, in general, I would say the cost of labor, you know, the overall, uh, what you call, you know, the production cost. Uh, so that's, I would say, is something which is uh, in favor of India. And at the same time, what has helped is that globally, the costs are going up. And especially one has seen in some of the geographies, you know, uh, particularly the energy cost, you know, given the geopolitical situation and otherwise have been going up. And, and in chemical in industry, you know, uh, uh, energy cost is definitely one of the key uh, element uh, for sure. Energy yeah. and labor. So on both front, I would say you know India has an advantage. Uh, third, I said you know over a period of time, uh, the overall quality you know of the, the corporates you know in terms of their overall behavior, their investment, let's say you know to deal with some of these global customer, the whole thrust on quality, uh, the whole thrust on supply chain. Uh, I mean this is also one of the very important aspect you know I would say as far as the chemical industry is concerned. See because. While I may be supplying a material, you know, which maybe is worth 20, 30 million to a customer, but for whatever reason, if my material doesn't reach him, his a billion dollar molecule could be at risk. Mm. So that's something which uh, over a period of time, you know, India has been able to kind of demonstrate and build. The last one I would put is the overall stability. Uh, I think in last 10 years, uh, uh, in particular, I would say, uh, India has been kind of a, a more put in a forefront, uh, you know, the stability of government, you know, maybe the uh, overall better policy mix so i would just say these are four or five factors you know which are kind of a, in a way helping uh the india cause uh so yeah uh, that, this is how i would sum it up is that why you know i believe uh, uh overall you know a lot of uh, what you call you know tailwinds are there in favor of uh, india and why uh, especially specialty chemical as an industry uh, would thrive uh, as far as india is concerned Talking specifically about Anpam Rasan, what's really your expansion plans? Because different brokerage reports have been extremely bullish, with your target price pegged at about over 1,000. So what really is feeding into that kind of optimism on the street? I may not be able to give you uh, a lot of, okay. chat, I would say, uh, limitation. Uh, but overall, you know, if I was to talk uh, more kind of a generic, which, we, which is what we have shared even in the past, I said uh, definitely one of those companies which has invested a bit ahead of time. Uh, you know, X amount of CapEx was done, you know, in the past, uh, currently also, you know, maybe a year and a half back, we did raise uh, roughly a hundred million, you know, in QIP. Idea was to invest that money as well, you know, in further, you know, what you call CapEx. And as I said, you know, we do believe, uh, you know, especially uh, for a chemical kind of a industry, you will have to keep investing. Uh, you will have to keep investing, you know, to grow. Uh, of course, for us, you know, whatever amount of CapEx, uh, you know, which we have kind of announced and, you know, we are undertaking currently would be more than sufficient for our uh, next, let's say, three to four years growth. Uh, and again, you know, maybe, so every four, three to four years or five years, you know, you would take a CAPEX cycle. Uh, idea would be to kind of, uh, you know, plan for next three to five years growth, uh, you know, from that CAPEX. So yes, we have, uh, you know, I would say been a bit ahead uh, of time, you know, to invest at uh, CAPEX. Also to just give you a little more uh, color. Uh, see, mm -hmm. things which we are doing differently than industry. Uh, most of the capex now which we are putting up uh, shrija is basically what we call as a multi purpose plant so typically in chemical industry what happens is that you build up a plant and you know that basically would make let's say product a just as an example uh, 
uh, and then you know there is x amount of demand which will keep up and down and then basis that your plant utilization will get decided uh, again here i would say uh, the vision of the promoter uh, you know uh, anand bhai uh, wherein he has started investing i would say early on in this multi purpose plant what it does is that rather than just producing one product on that plant it allows me to basically take three or four campaign uh, you know in our parallels of three or more three or four products in a year so what i could do is that basically let's say produce product a for three months b maybe for six months and maybe c for three months uh, by this while my capex cost you know would go up maybe by uh, i would say 20 to 25 percent but you could imagine uh, you know in terms of efficiency uh, i could easily be at least 2x or 3x of my peer so Absolutely. that's something which is really, I would say, uh, a bit of a, a investment which has gone ahead of technology. Two, I would say, in terms of our capex, you know, what we have been able to master uh, is as against batch process, which is what you know most of the chemical guys do. We have been able to master the art of continuous, or mm -hmm. what we call as a flow chemistry. So imagine something which uh, uh, you know gets done in batch. Let's say uh, the reaction, you know, maybe in ten hours or twenty hours, we are able to do that continuously so just to give you one of the uh, machine you know which uh, we have imported and we are probably among the only two uh, you know in india who have that machine a process which you know takes 4 hours you know in that machine uh, you know because of the continuous flow can be done in 4 minutes so wow. of course the, the uh, what you call the output eventually in the day end would be the same but you know you are able to now you know run it through uh, imagine like you know the the kind of a maybe a 5 kilometer or you know maybe a x kilometer of pipes and you know it's it's, it's able to uh, happen you know on a continuous basis so it helps me a lot on my efficiency cost it helps me a lot lot on quality it helps me a lot you know in terms of i said again the overall diversification so these are some of those example you know where anupam has taken a bit of a, a lead i would say uh, and that's something which is again you know making us a bit differentiated uh, with some of our peers okay, can, i also want to understand more about your business model uh, because who are your clientele? What is the nature of your clientele? Because when you say you're a B2B business, that's the most exciting part of business to be in. Because it's an annuity income, it's a stream of annuity income that keeps coming in, which takes care of the business. Do you think that do you have those very long-term fixed clientele set where the annuity income stream is assured? No, so uh, uh, that, that's a good question, Shija. Uh, uh, I would just say, you know, from a business model perspective, uh, we would typically have, if not more, uh, I would say almost 75 to 80 percent of my revenue coming from long-term contracts. Uh, and as I said, in most of these, uh, you know, long-term contracts, either I would be the only supplier uh, to, let's say, my customer, or I would be the primary uh, supplier to him, which would mean that there will be a second guy, but I may be taking a lion's share of, you know, uh, the supplies to him. Uh, and the reason why we have chosen this model, and again, I would say the, uh, that's the that's been the philosophy of the company that we would rather take you know, a long-term approach, uh, and which is where I said we go through the rigorous, you know, what you call a whole uh, uh, process of customer approval or product approval, which takes, as I said, anywhere between two to five years. Uh, there have been some cases where we have been working with the customer, for example, one of the recent product which we are going to, you know, uh, which we have been approved uh, by our US guy, we have been working with them for five years. And we have been finally able to kind of uh, get everything right, uh, uh, you know, from their perspective. So it's not that uh, we could not produce. We could produce even you know two years down the line as well. But you know there are certain aspects, there are certain you know things which you need to work upon. And finally, we are you know kind of approved by that customer. Uh, of course, if you are taking X amount of that long term approach, what in turn you would uh, you know expect from a customer and what he will also be happy to give is those long term contracts. So typically, most of our business you know have anywhere between a five to seven year uh, kind of a contract. Now there have been cases where you know we've been supplying uh, you know a product. Uh, for last 30 years or 40 years to also custom. Mm -hmm. That's that's basically, I would say, is a more of a model where we are very clearly, uh, you know, doing something which is, and we, which is where also, I think, I would say for most of our product, we follow this philosophy of what we call as the one product and one customer. And which is also helping us to ensure that there's no IP kind of a challenge or otherwise, you know, from a customer end perspective. Uh, and that kind of a keeps the business kind of a ticking. I said, it, it's something which is difficult to come. Uh, but yeah, once it's come, uh, as long as you are kind of, uh, you know, uh, doing enough and more to ensure that you don't disturb the supply chain and you are giving, uh, I would say, uh, uh, you know, the quality product to him at the most competitive, uh, let's say, kind of a prices, uh, I, I think the business model that way, you know, would have X amount of annuity built into it. 
that's the hallmark of trust, right? Long-term pain contracts, even for five years, and you're doing businesses with them. So tell me one thing, what was the reason for the QIP raise? And what, how smooth was the process? And what really are your expansion plans entailed against that? Where do you go from him? Yep. So uh, uh, I would say that the QIP, you know, was largely uh, driven as, uh, you know, to do this, uh, I would say, uh, further capex, uh, you know, and for uh, some of the LOIs, what we call as the contracts, you know, which we had signed with the customer. And as I said previously, with this uh, capex plan, which we have taken up, which should basically more or less finish, uh, maybe I would say in quarter one or quarter two of next year, uh, we would build a capacity which would, uh, you know, be sufficient uh, for our next uh, three to four years growth. Uh, and, you know, in the past, I think we have had, you know, X amount of CAGI growth. We do hope that we will be able to even do better than that. So uh, in nutshell, what I'm trying to tell you is that this CAPEX basically would be good enough uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, I'm able to kind of grow my revenue for next three to four years without incurring any further CAPEX. Uh, also, as I said, you know, given that you are, you know, while, you know, it's good to say that I'm the only uh, guy who's supplying to the customer, or I'm the primary guy. But we appreciate from customer's perspective, you know, mm -hmm. he's also taking a huge amount of, I would say, calculated, uh, uh, what you call cost yes. risk. Yeah. Uh, and which is where, you know, I think we also need to uh, do our bit uh, to ensure, as I said, uh, whether it is multi-purpose plant. Also, you know, given that these are multi-purpose plant, what it does is that I would have site one, you know, where when I may be producing, let's say, for a customer. But then if tomorrow something was to kind of uh, go wrong or something was to, you know, uh, not uh, go as per the plan, you know, I would have site two ready for him or site three ready for him. So this is how basically we are ensuring that the customer would never, you know, ever have a situation where, you know, he is suffering because of me not being able to kind of supply to him. Uh, coming back to the uh, overall growth plan, as I said, uh, definitely uh, one of, uh, you know, uh, the company uh, which has invested, uh, you know, enough and more to ensure that there is a three to four years of growth, uh, which is taken care uh, on two sides. So one is to ensure that you are winning enough and more contracts, let's say, with your customer, and on the other side that you're doing, you know, X amount of capex. So to share, as we speak, currently I have 90 plus products, you know, which are under, let's say, various stages of mm -hmm. customer approval. So this journey is something which is, I would say, a bit continuous, where you'll keep having, you know, newer customers, you'll have, uh, you know, you'll keep adding onto newer segments. Uh, and happy to talk about some of those, uh, because largely, you know, initially we are more agrochemical focus, but now, you know, we are getting into a lot more into pharma, we're getting a lot more into polymer. Uh, and this is basically, I would say definitely, you know, a couple of uh, what you call this thing, which are driving the growth uh, for us going forward. So what are your target sectors? So, so the company also gone through a journey from agrochemical to normal pharma, life sciences, and those kind of spaces. So we're focusing on these spaces now going forward. Yep. So as I was saying, you know, uh, uh, I would say if you look at it, maybe more like five years back, maybe almost 80% uh, of my, you know, uh, sales were in and around agrochemical. Uh, mm -hmm. But then, you know, uh, the whole idea was to basically look at which are the newer segments, you know, which we can kind of get into. Uh, and we chose uh, uh, basically pharma, uh, you know, because that's something which is definitely one of the uh, growing uh, segment, both I would say internationally as well as domestically. And I'll come to why I'm saying domestic. And then also we basically uh, looked at expanding on our uh, polymer, uh, basically, uh, chains, uh, which includes both the monomers as well as, you know, we are doing, uh, 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 let's say, a good amount of work on the electric vehicles. So basically the batteries which, you know, are used by this vehicle, we produce certain uh, salts uh, or solvents, you know, for those. So uh, I would say... Uh, one of the biggest growth is going you know, to for us come from both the segment while you know agrochemical would be there uh, and it will go steadily uh, but yeah we we would get uh, you know x amount of growth uh, uh, from pharma uh, and you know the polymer as well as on the uh, ev uh, chemicals uh, as well uh, also i think one of the thing which uh, we did uh, a year and a half back uh, is this whole fluorination uh, so we basically acquired a company called tanfac you know down south uh, and that basically gave us, us uh, gave us a edge, you know, on the whole fluorination, uh, you know, industry. Uh, and as I said again, one of the philosophy of the company has been to ensure that we have backward integration. So while we were doing, uh, you know, a lot of product with our customer, uh, the final product, uh, you know, which were on the fluorination side. But one of the key concern uh, which the customer always had is that you don't have a 
uh, what we call backward integration. So that acquisition basically of Tecta, in fact, uh, allowed us to be fully backward integrated. And which is where now, you know, you are seeing the, the fruits of that is that because all the work was done ahead of time, as far as the product approval and all that is concerned, having, you know, got, uh, let's say, time track our fold, in short that, you know, uh, we were able to kind of uh, uh, capture that part of, uh, let's say, product segment pretty well. So for me, uh, you know, at Anupam, agrochemical will grow steadily. Uh, X amount of growth uh, will come from pharma and uh, the polymer side of it. And uh, the third leg to the growth is going to be this whole fluorination uh, uh, part of it, where which, where there are only few, uh, you know, what you call, which, you know, whether in India or outside, you know, you can count very few niche, uh, what you call uh, the corporates who basically have this uh, capability. This sounds very interesting. This entire EV salt space, particularly because EV space is currently booming, right? I mean, there's so much of talk and fascination with electric vehicle space. Tell me a little about that. What really is exact plan there? So uh, again, here, you know, uh, as I said, one uh, of the thought was uh, to, as I said, diversify from a segment perspective, but even from a market perspective, I think for us, uh, US and Japan uh, are, I would say, again, from a market perspective. So we have been largely, uh, you know, uh, agrochemical guy and Europe was one of the biggest market for us. Uh, of course, we did see, uh, you know, some of the, I would say, overall slowdown coming in Europe. Uh, and which is where for us, it was important that we uh, start looking at some of the other markets. Uh, and uh, Japan is something which now we have been working for over, I would say, almost uh, 10 years. Uh, US is something which, again, uh, we've been working for over four, five years. Uh, Japan has given us an X amount of success and US is, of course, now, you know, kind of forgetting the asset because there is a gestation. It takes anywhere between two to four years for us to really, you know, onboard a customer and uh, some other product. Coming back specifically to EV, uh, you know, we are seeing huge amount of growth, you know, uh, from both this, uh, what you call geography. Uh, because you have uh, lots of, I would say, customers who are working on this value chain, both in US as well as in Japan. Uh, and our idea would be to basically, uh, you know, be partner to them and supply them some of those, uh, as I said, salt and solvent, which go into uh, making of those battery. And as you rightly said, uh, EV is uh, the future, uh, which I don't think so any of us have really any doubt about. And that is why, you know, from our perspective also, we did choose, uh, uh, you know, let's say a segment where we do believe, uh, you know, there's going to be exponential growth. Uh, uh, and uh, which is where, you know, we got our technology team, you know, our R&D team to really put X amount of effort and ensure that we are able to come out with uh, uh, some of those molecules uh, you know, which will give us that edge, uh, you know, in that segment. And I'm happy to say uh, we have been reasonably, uh, more than reasonably successful in that. Acquisition. For someone like you on board, the Maverick deal maker, I know the acquisition have to be on the annual. So what really are you planning next in terms of some growth opportunities or some area that you would want to plug, which are not in the portfolio and would want to plug through acquisitions? So uh, I may not be able to kind of share specific uh, Stija, but uh, you know, as you rightly said, definitely inorganic is something which is uh, uh, clearly uh, I would say one of the focus area uh, for us. Uh, and as I mm -hmm. shared, something like Tanfek, uh, you know, Touchwood has panned out very well, uh, not only for us, you know, in terms of the uh, product edition, but even for the uh, stakeholders of Tanfek, uh, you know, because we could really you know add that extra bit which was kind of, I would say, required. Uh, and, you know, the company has uh, really grown in that one half year uh, tremendously, you know, uh, post our coming in. So we do believe, I think uh, there are certain, uh, I would say, kind of a uh, segment where we need to kind of uh, add on the uh, capacity side of it. I will not say capability, uh, touch wood capability side, we have enough and more going for us. Uh, but what we are looking to do is basically fast pace uh, that growth. So rather than trying to kind of uh, do a green field, uh, we are uh, kind of uh, constantly on a watch uh, uh, to look at acquisition target, I would say both uh, in India as well as outside of India. Oh. Uh, so yeah, uh, depending upon, you know, whatever kind of a suits uh, our need uh, or fits into our kind of criteria, we are more than uh, happy to look at uh, doing uh, or achieving that through inorganic growth. So of course, uh, this is something which is clearly one of the key aspect of our uh, growth strategy going forward. Having said it, uh, of course, you know, one would be uh, what you call decently calculative, uh, you know, in terms of what you want to do, what size you want to do, when you want to do. Uh, so the, all that, uh, you know, hygiene would be there. But uh, uh, definitely, you know, in organic is something which is part of our uh, growth strategy going forward. So far, we're getting towards the end of the conversation. What a fascinating conversation really it has been. I also wanted to understand from you. If there's an entrepreneur who's venturing into the specialty chemical business, say in 2024, 
what really would be your pros and cons advice? Do you think it is a space to venture in? Do you think the technological advancement is much easier? Or do you think it is very difficult to secure contracts or long-term contracts? What about the competition? Give us some sense. So I would say, uh, you know, the growth in the market is huge. Uh, and especially, as I said, there are enough and more tailwinds uh, in favor of India. So to that extent, is there enough and more market for, you know, let's say uh, someone new who wants to come in? The answer is very clearly yes. Uh, what one is to do, uh, Shrija, uh, is that definitely look at investing for long term. Uh, as I was telling you, uh, you know, in the past, you know, most of these chemical guys have basically either been doing a lot amount of commodity uh, kind of a play or, you know, uh, maybe limited kind of a, let's say, uh, steps or reaction as we call it, you know, doing two or three reaction and then, you know, kind of a importing from somewhere and or, you know, buying domestically and then, you know, just sending it back. Uh, trust me, you know, this is not going to hold you, uh, you know, what you call, it's not going to keep you uh, survive in long term. What you got to do is focus on your core chemistry. Uh, you got to, you know, prob so less is more. Rather than trying to kind of uh, get into maybe I would say 10 products, you may want to focus on one or two uh, chemistries or, you know, one or two product segment. Uh, wherein you would be one of those guys who would have, uh, let's say, X amount of backward integration, who would have maybe a bit of an edge, you know, uh, where you will be able to invest a lot more on the R&D, you know, compared to somebody else. You would be globally competitive. See, one thing is very clear. Uh, while, you know, one can talk about any amount of diversification, but nobody is going to give you a business at a higher price. You will have to, mm -hmm. while you have to ensure the supply chain, while you have to ensure the, uh, the, the quality part of it, while you have to do a amount of capex, but you've got to be at the same time competitive as well. So where I'm coming from is that that will not happen if you're going to be, you know, into 10 things. So you better focus, you know, where your strengths are, you better more look at long term, uh, you know, what is going to work for you. And which is where what I'm you know happy to see is that most of the, uh, you know, my peers, I would say in the industry, uh, who have been, you know, let's say more embarking on that commodity journey, slowly and steadily are realizing that and, you know, at least trying to focus now, not that everybody will be able to do it. So whether it's them or anybody new, I would just say think long term. Uh, don't try to kind of get into a short term. Trust me, it's not going to work. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, now it's it's a global, uh, what you call, uh, you know, got to be globally competitive. Uh, you could only survive, you know, uh, provided you are, I would say, just ahead of your peer on every aspect. So you have to pick up your niche, strengthen yourself in that instead of doing 10 things, do two things, but do them exceptionally well with the global standard. And you yeah. have to be competitive when it comes to pricing, right? I also want to understand from you, Bopa, like we, we had Papan Duradia of Equitry on our podcast recently, and he said something very interesting that Shrija, mid-caps are the places where the maximum wealth creation has happened in the stock market. I wanted to sort of ask you this, that since you are in that same space, what will be your message to the larger investor fraternity of Do you think these companies, like companies like yours, which have the characteristics of a private company, so to speak, are really the beacons of future growth in the country where the maximum wealth creation can happen? I think, as you rightly said, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, there is a X amount of, let's say, what you call reward, which will come with Y amount of calculated I would not say risk, but, you know, uh, maybe a bit of a, what you call, uh, uh, you know, uh, you kind of are taking a pain to, you know, really, uh, you know, identify the sector, identify the company. So I would not say that, you know, every segment or every, you know, company, you know, uh, every medium-sized company is something which anybody and everybody would want to look at. Uh, of course, once you identify a segment which you believe is going to really help the cause, then, of course, you need to identify a company which is, uh, you know, kind of a, probably doing it differently and which would have a long-term uh, future. Goes without saying, uh, you know, uh, these are the, uh, you know, the the, the medium-sized companies are the ones which have really generated maximum amount of wealth. Uh, I would also say in the same breath that they are the companies which also need the investor. I'm not saying the uh, biggest don't, but you would, uh, uh, you know, see uh, the most of the large, uh, what you call uh, cap companies today are, uh, you know, having a different struggle where they're sitting with why amount of cash and they don't know what to do with it. Absolutely. Uh, while as you know, there are companies, you know, in, in the mid side segment who basically have a huge potential to really grow. Uh, one will have to obviously be careful, you know, in terms of selecting, uh, you know, which are those companies be. Uh, but yeah, if you ask me, uh, where would the maximum growth, uh, you know, in terms of the risk reward lies, uh, I think it's definitely, uh, you know, the, the mid size companies, uh, whether it's Anupam or anybody else. Uh, uh, but yeah, I do really see 
you know, this uh, uh, size of companies would really are the ones which can, you know, look at growing for the 25, 30% CAGR for next five years, seven years or 10 years or 15 years. You mm -hmm. can't definitely have, I'm not saying that, you know, there could be one or two, but most of the large cap, you know, would, uh, you know, uh, would be able to kind of show maximum, maybe like a good single digit uh, or maybe a, you know, a, a very low uh, two digit kind of a growth. Uh, but these mid-sized companies have the potential to really grow at 25-30% CAGR, which is, I'm sure if you look at it from a global perspective, where, you know, uh, companies are struggling to even, you know, uh, grow, I would say, low single digit. Yeah, it really provides a big opportunity. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think this is where uh, uh, I would say both the companies and the investor need to kind of uh, work with each other uh, to ensure that there is a uh, win-win which is created uh, for both. Thanks for that, Kupal. That's sort of very, very well put. My last question is because there's no conversation which can be actually complete without the golden word, which is artificial intelligence, which really is the buzzword in all corporate circles. I want to understand from you that AI and the way AI has come over, first we thought we'd come up to menial jobs, the jobs in large factories, but generative AI has come for people like us, the creators, the creative people also. I want to understand from you that are you also using AI in Pondersign anyway? And what does that really hold the manufacturing industry at large? So uh, I, I guess maybe first one is that, you know, AI is something which, uh, you know, all of us have to uh, be, you know, what you call aware of that this is something which is going to really help the cause. Now, whether uh, or not, you know, you take an effort or, you know, whether you invest in it, it's kind of an individual call. Uh, but I do believe, uh, you know, AI is really uh, kind of a helping all the businesses uh, at large. Now, there could be some businesses where it could be more useful, uh, you know, and some uh, it could be less. Uh, if I talk about, uh, you know, Anupam, I think we definitely are investing X amount of effort, energy and investment in AI. Uh, and you would be surprised at wow. what, what AI can really do, uh, you know, in, in the chemical industry. But see... Even we have a choice to make, you know, in terms of if I have a portfolio of, let's say, 500 product to choose from, which one I should be really kind of, a, you know, uh, choosing or giving a priority, or, you know, uh, to A versus B. Hmm. Even in terms of my putting X amount of R&D effort, which, which, is, which are the ones, you know, where I should be really, you know, focusing more. That's number one. Two is that even in terms of the whole production planning, uh, you know, you have decent amount of moving parts, you know, when it comes to basically doing, and I said, especially for someone like us who has multi-purpose plant, we have uh, like some seven, uh, you know, what we call locations, you know, at which we have, uh, and then there are, you know, each location will have multiple plants. So, you know, to even get this whole uh, production planning kind of organized, just to ensure that every, uh, you know, aspect of that is kind of a taken care and all that, uh, there is a, uh, there is a X amount of role which AI can play, uh, you know, and which is what, you know, we basically have been working on. As I said, uh, uh, you know, the form and shape of that could be very different than a consumer company uh, or, or a IT company. Uh, but is this something which is going to be useful? The answer to that is very clearly yes. Uh, do we believe in it? Answer is yes. Are we really, you know, investing X amount of uh, uh, time, effort and money on it? Again, I would say answer to all of the three is yes. A sort of really, a, I would say a handbook on specialty chemicals industry in India. My last question just to sort of end this conversation really is was that do you see any near-term challenges as to how you are building this organization? What would those really be near-term or long-term challenges? I would say, I, I, you know, one of the biggest things which I see is that I said any of us, you know, uh, today are competing, you know, globally. So you got to be, you know, doing enough and more, uh, you know, as I said, whether it is on the technology side, whether it is on the supply chain side, whether it is on the process side, uh, to ensure that you are kind of staying ahead, uh, you know, of the of the of the competition. Uh, so to me, uh, you know, you got to be on your toes uh, to ensure that you are, uh, you know, doing at par or better than your, you know, your peers globally. Uh, that's something which is for sure there. Two, it may not be, you know, like you know, in some of the industry that you know things are changing overnight. But trust me, even in chemicals, you know, things are changing very fast. There are products which, you know, are probably going out of favor and hence, you know, suddenly you realize that I was sitting on X amount of molecule which were, you know, having Y amount of market and, you know, things have changed. So you've got to constantly, I would say, invest in technology. You've got to invest in your research and development to ensure that you are able to, you know, uh, either do the same thing much more efficiently or, you know, are able to kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, be, I would say, ahead of your competition 
and you know keep innovating uh, which is what will keep you ahead of the you know uh, let's say some of the peers and trust me that's the only way to survive uh, you know people always talk about innovation you know on a lighter note only in the it industry but chemical industry to me is no less you got to constantly innovate you got to constantly work uh, you know uh, you know whether it is on the process side whether it is on the engineering side of it to ensure that you are doing you know better than you know anybody you know let's say uh, who's kind of a, you know your competition globally to ensure that you kind of a stay uh, you know in the race uh, otherwise i mean there have you know i have seen some of uh, let's say uh, companies or corporates both in india and you know i would say globally going out of business just because of either the technology or you know they are not able to compete on cost or they are not able to kind of a solve for uh, you know the, the supply chain part thanks for that gopal on the face of it a speciality chemical company or a manufacturing company can look so boring and banal but look at it from this conversation we understood it is so fascinating how you are using technology embracing it embracing ai at every level you have to take a decision on which technology to use because like you said if you defend and extend your technology you might just get irrelevant so it's actually technology played its part where a lot of tech work is being driven so much innovation is happening on a daily basis thanks for that gopal